Hello everyone. My name is Kamal Manocha. I represent PMSAF World. PMSAF World is informed investments based quality investing platform. We are backed by data, backed by analysis, and we offer quality investing service. We have been running a webinar series by name Crystal Gazing Next Decade of Wealth Creation for Investors. While we are crystal gazing the next decade for wealth creation for our investors, you know, we cannot miss talking about role of international equities. And hence, today we have amongst us Mr. Viram Shah, who is the CEO and founder with Vested. Vested is one of very unique companies, platform, which offers Indian investors to invest in US equities without paying a single penny in commission. So it is a zero commission platform, which gives direct access to investors to invest into Indian equity, to invest into US equities. So, you know, US equities over of late have been kind of rallying a lot. And there is another very important fact about US equity markets in terms of price to earning. If we compare US equity markets to Indian context, India's trailing PE today, all of us know, maybe it is less relevant, but it is more than 32, around 32, 33 on trailing uh, earning numbers. But at the same time, U.S. equities are trading at are trading at maybe around 22, 23 as a P number. And from the perspective of diversification, when one is investing with the context of next 10 years, investing in U.S. equities definitely makes some sense. What percentage one should be investing in U.S. equities? How should one invest into U.S. equities? What is it that Vested as a platform offers? How can you log in into the platform? How can you create your account? And what are the other value added services? All that will be covered in this session. I formally welcome you, Viram, to uh, uh, this webinar and over to you. You are on mute. You have to unmute yourself. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Kamal, and thanks for having me here on this forum. And uh, good evening to everybody who is attending. Thank you for taking time out on a Friday evening. Uh, there's there's a lot of um, video calls happening and, and everybody is super busy. So So thanks again for taking the time out. Let me quickly share my screen. I have uh, some slides that, that I'll go through to just structure the, the uh, topic that I want to talk on and, uh, and, and sort of what we'll be covering today uh, is basically about, about five parts. One is just uh, why US investing, why as an Indian investor would you want to uh, invest into the US markets? We talk a little bit about what are the regulations, how does taxation work if you want to invest in the U.S. markets. Uh, we'll also look at kind of how you go about doing it through Vested. So a little bit about Vested as a company. What I want, also want to cover is some, some myths or uh, some kind of uh, misconceptions that might be there. So want to cover those as well today. And so that, that pretty much covers what we'll be going through. And uh, if you have questions, please, please feel free to, to drop them uh, at any point in time. And uh, we can take them all in one go after, after we finish the presentation. And uh, yeah, lastly, just from, uh, from uh, kind of a, a disclaimer point of view. So uh, we are an SEC registered investment advisor. And so any, any, uh, anything on, in this presentation is, is uh, to be construed as information and, and not as any kind of advice. Uh, great. So let's get going so basically to start with I, I just wanted to highlight kind of what are the different kinds of diversification that you would look like look at uh, in terms of your investment portfolio so there is one pillar of diversification which is called uh, asset based diversification so you're investing in different kind of asset classes say for example investing into um, real estate you're investing into equities you're investing into debt so there are multiple asset classes that you want to diversify into the other pillar is industry-based diversification. So uh, you want to be investing your money across different industries, such as, say, financial services, technology, uh, pharma, so that not all of your eggs are in one basket. The third uh, pillar of diversification to create a good portfolio is time-based diversification. So you don't want to invest all your money in one go into the market. And essentially, you want to spread it out in different periods of time. And, and that's what we have become good at doing uh, because of the entire SIP awareness and SIP culture that has been created in India. The, the last diversification pillar is essentially something that has been missing largely in a, in a lot of our portfolios. And that's a geography-based diversification. Essentially, you don't want to be investing all of your money in 
uh, one particular country or one particular currency. And that's why now the concept of uh, geographic or global diversification is gaining more and more importance. And that's what we want to cover today. Uh, essentially, looking at global diversification via the U.S. markets and why particularly the U.S. markets, one of the big, big reasons is that it's the largest and the deepest markets in the world. So about 45% uh, of the global market cap uh, is in the U.S. And if you compare it to India, uh, we're at about one and a half trillion or so, so which is about 3%. And uh, in, in terms of just investment fund assets also, uh, U.S. is the largest market. So essentially what that means is you basically get access to a deep, a liquid uh, and a widespread market, which offers you different opportunities to invest. And, and that's why you want to be investing through the U.S. markets. Now, why do you want to invest into the U.S.? Right? Why, why as an Indian investor should you be looking uh, to invest into the U.S. markets? And so... Here, the way we look at it is primarily four reasons why you should be doing it. Uh, one reason is you want to be able to uh, hedge against the rupee depreciation. So um, over the last few years, the rupee across, uh, against the dollar has depreciated uh, over time. And, and what that has led to is while the Indian markets might have done well, uh, on a global scale, the wealth does not stand as relevant because the rupee has depreciated. So I'll talk a little bit about it in detail uh, over the next few slides, but that's one reason why you want to look at it. The second is, as we spoke uh, earlier, is, is diversification. Right? You want to spread your, uh, spread your investments across different baskets. And so this is an avenue for you to um, globally diversify your investments. And you also get access to different asset classes. So you can invest into um, stocks, you can invest into debt, you can invest into REITs. Uh, so different, different asset classes that you can invest uh, internationally. The third is something that might be specific to uh, each one's case is if you're looking at a future dollar spending, if you're looking at, say, um, going abroad yourself to live, or if you're sending your kids abroad or you're going abroad to study, uh, those kind of expenses are, are usually in dollars. And so you want your savings currency to match that. And so you want to have some kind of dollar store, uh, which is something that you're looking at for your future goal. And the last one is uh, something that we, we did research on uh, a few weeks ago was essentially if you're investing in uh, companies that have listed subsidiaries in India, investing the parent can actually be a more uh, efficient way of investing in those companies. So now just want to dig a little bit deeper into all four of these points. And the first one is basically just from a returns plus a currency depreciation standpoint. And uh, if you look at it in terms of returns, so uh, over the last 10 years, just to interrupt, can you try and change the uh, view? Because I guess, you know, uh, most uh, audience would be logged in from mobile phone and maybe they are unable to see the clear view. This is the presenter's view. Oh, oh really? Huh. Okay. Give me a second. I am seeing it from my laptop. To me, it, it looks fine, but somebody who's logged in from mobile, you know, it could be looking very, very small. Oh, it's probably because I have, let me see, two screens on. How about now? this window you can try to expand this window uh, this work better Does this work better? Come on. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Okay, cool. Sorry for that. Uh, there was not much to see on the slides anyway before this, but now anyway, if you look at the charts. So what I was talking about was just from a return standpoint, uh, if you compare the Sensex to the Dow Jones, which is the, the um, kind of like for like comparison, uh, for over the last 10 years, the Dow Jones has given about a 188% return versus 122% for the Sensex. And uh, that is 
comparing them in their individual local currencies. So the Dow Jones in USD and the Sensex in INR. And then if you add to it the, the rupee depreciation over the last 10 years, the rupee uh, 10 years ago was at about 45. Now it's at, at close to uh, about 75 or so. And if you add to that um, this rupee depreciation, the, the, the returns actually in terms of um, dollars for India uh, actually become quite low. And, and so uh, that's what we mean, uh, mean by the, the fact that the rupee depreciation hurts returns on a global scale. So the Dow Jones, if you look at just from a USD perspective, it's at 188%. However, the Sensex from a USD perspective is at 34%. And so say, for example, you had invested about 4,500 in the US about 10 years ago. In, in terms of, uh, sorry, in the Sensex about 10 years ago, you would have about 10,000 rupees right now and, and a return of about 8% every year. Whereas if you had invested the same uh, 4,500 rupees in the, the Dow Jones 10 years ago, right now you would have about 20,000, almost a double uh, in terms of returns at, at an annual return of, of about 17%. So that's basically the US markets doing well along with the rupee depreciating uh, about 3 to 4% every year that, that gives you these kind of returns. Now the second point which we talked about was just creating these geographically diversified portfolios, right? You want to have that fourth pillar in your portfolio um, the way you want to think about it is you're moving away from uh, a single country, single currency risk, and, and that gives you the opportunity to invest essentially in global, global assets. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, and you can look at bonds, commodities, real estate uh, in the U.S. markets that, uh, to, to invest into. Why you want to, to be able to have a geographically diversified portfolio is uh, one of the reasons is, is basically the core, uh, core reason why you diversify, right? You, you diversify so that you have different assets uh, whose returns are not correlated to each other. So if one is moving up, the other can move. Uh, if one is moving down, the other can move up. If one is moving up, the other can move down to kind of give you overall returns. Um, uh, overall returns that are balanced out and the, the risk in your portfolio is reduced. And so uh, if you look at the, the correlation, which is the measure of, of how um, each market tracks the other market, uh, the correlation between the Sensex and the Dow Jones is actually quite low. It's about 0.36. And in addition to it, if you look at the, the risk of the U.S. market, which is measured using uh, standard deviation, the risk is, is less in the U.S. markets, uh, albeit now recently it has changed. Uh, but overall, over the last few years, it has been, uh, it has been less compared to the Indian markets. And uh, another key reason why you want to uh, be able to create a, a diversified portfolio and one of the reasons to invest uh, in the U.S. markets is basically getting the opportunity to invest in technology, right? If you, if you believe that it's the age of technology, technology companies are going to um, drive the future, and, and then you want to be able to invest in them as well. And, and um, there's limited exposure available in the, the Indian markets, and that's why uh, international investing, specifically the U.S. markets, gives you this opportunity. And so if you just look at the chart on the left, it's basically the, the information technology ETF versus the S&P 500 and how technology has outperformed the market in the U.S. as well. And what you can do additionally is invest into themes that are going to play out in the future. And you have a lot of these companies that are working on these cutting edge themes that are listed on the U.S. market. So some of these themes are, are artificial intelligence, um, CRISPR in the healthcare space, uh, there's cloud computing, cannabis. And so you get the opportunity to invest in uh, a lot of these cutting edge uh, leading companies through the US markets. The third, as I mentioned earlier, if you have any kind of US dollar spending in the future, then it basically allows you to save in the same currency. And lastly, if you're looking at, say, investing into um, subsidiaries of any companies that are listed in India, so Unilever is one example, um, Pfizer is another example, what, what we saw was these subsidiaries are actually trading at, at about three times the, the um, PE of the U.S. company, but then the returns are not actually three times. And so uh, it might be more efficient to look at the, the parent company listed in the U.S. if you really believe in any of these particular companies. So those are the key reasons. Uh, we can now look into just how regulation-wise uh, can an Indian resident or um, essentially an NRI is also, but particularly today, Indian residents invest in the U.S. markets. So the way it works in terms of taxation is uh, basically you have to pay taxes only in India. 
there are no taxes payable in the US. And uh, the way taxes work is uh, there is, um, in terms of capital gains, there's a pure threshold for long term gains. And um, once you cross that threshold, the rate applicable is 20% with indexation benefit. Uh, so that rate actually effectively becomes less. And if it's short term, then it is as per your income tax slab. In terms of uh, dividends, there is a, a withholding in the US. So there's a 25% withholding uh, whenever you get any kind of dividend directly in your brokerage account. But what you can do is actually take credit for that dividend that you paid uh, in the US in India. And uh, that is uh, that, that you can do because of the double tax avoidance agreement between uh, India and the US. And what we do at Vested is actually provide to you all of the documents that you need as per the Indian fiscal year to file the, the, these returns. So that includes there's a Form 67, there's a, a schedule of foreign assets, and also how you calculate your capital gains in INR uh, as per the regulations set out. So that, that's something that we simplify for, for our users. In terms of just regulatory wise, um, we are an SEC registered investment advisor, and uh, that allows us to provide US investing uh, under the under the gambit of the SEC. In terms of regulations from the India perspective, so uh, there is this scheme by the RBI called the liberalized remittance scheme, uh, essentially that allows an individual to remit up to two and a half lakh dollars each year abroad uh, for different purposes. One of the purposes is investments into portfolio. Uh, equities abroad and and this this uh, limit has essentially been increasing over time and it's been stable at two and a half lakh dollars since the last few years so that's that's on regulation in terms of just some um, some myths that I wanted to talk about today uh, one of that is, one of them is is that there are um, local ETFs and um, these ETFs allow you to invest into indexes in the US uh, some some believe that that's the best possible opportunity that they can get to invest internationally. However, there are just some um, considerations that I wanted to highlight. Uh, one is the fact that uh, the, the the ETFs have an underlying expense ratio, and uh, these expense ratios tend to be much higher than what you'd actually originally pay in the US. So, for example, for an S&P 500 ETF in the US, the the Vanguard ETF has an expense ratio of about um, 0 0.03 or 0 0.05. Whereas uh, that expense ratio in India could be actually 10 to 20 times higher uh, for the same underlying index. There also tends to be some kinds of tracking errors. So because you can, uh, you, as, a, as a fund house, you have to hold some cash. Uh, also, there is an INR to USD conversion that ends up being a, a sort of a, a, a impact on the returns. And what we saw was in terms of the NASDAQ 100, there was a 2% a difference in annual returns. And that led, led to, a, uh, this is over the last 10 years. And so that led to a uh, overall loss of returns of about 20%. Uh, taxation wise, it is 36 months for long-term capital gains and uh, versus it's 24 months for the direct route. And just in terms of asset allocation, I think that's the most important uh, perspective. It's basically investing in the index, which is the S&P 500. It's actually a very concentrated index. I'll, I'll talk about it in a, in a couple of slides, but it's a very concentrated index and uh, might not be the best way to create a, a risk optimized portfolio. You might want to you might want to spread your investment across different asset classes so you're so that you're getting the, the best risk, risk optimized return. And uh, I'll also talk about what some model portfolios could look like across different asset classes. The other myth that uh, really exists is that um, direct U.S. investing is, is very difficult. Uh, a lot of investors feel like, like it's very complex. Um, taxes are very intimidating. Uh, wiring USD from India is complex. Uh, it, it, people feel that it's expensive because of the high commissions or you require minimum deposits. That, in fact, is um, not true. And, and that is something that is a phenomenon of the last, uh, last 12 to 18 months or so where technology has enabled platforms like, like Vessel to exist, which simplify the direct U.S. investing experience so that you can actually open up a brokerage account uh, in the U.S. in an easy manner and, and invest directly uh, into the stocks or ETFs that you might want to buy. So what, 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 uh, what we enable is basically you can get started in a very easy manner uh, via web or mobile. You go through a KYC, which is paperless, completely online. The fund transfer process uh, is something that has been simplified from what it used to be earlier under the LRS, under sort of capital account where investment falls. Uh, there's also going to be significant improvements in the next two to three months, which will make it much more seamless as well. Uh, what also has now been enabled, and one of the key reasons why 
U.S. investing now makes sense than say one or two years ago is the ability to buy fractional shares. So uh, earlier, if you wanted to invest into an Amazon, say for example, it, it was basically three thousand dollars. Now those three thousand dollars it translates into like two 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 lakhs in one go to buy one share, which is very expensive. So now fractional investing has enabled people to build their portfolio over time in an easy manner. Uh, also, you don't have to pay ridiculously high commissions and lose a lot of your returns in just fees. Uh, it's a commission-free platform that allows you to invest in an easy manner, and you don't need to have any minimum deposits. What you also get is is advice. So, if you want to invest beyond the Facebook, Apple's, Google's of the world, how do you create a portfolio? That is also something that's available now uh, through through our platform to to invest in an easy manner. And the third one I wanted to talk about uh, is that S and P 500 is a good representation of the U.S. markets. Um, it's actually a very concentrated index. So if you just uh, look at the chart on the left, of course it shows you how the returns for the S and P 500 have been. If you look on the chart, uh, you look at the chart on the right, you see actually a lot of those returns are driven by the what they call the fan or the the large technology companies, the Facebook, Apple, Googles of the world. The other two lines, the red and the yellow line, actually are the charts without uh, uh, the red one specifically is the S and P 500 without the technology companies, and you can see that the performance has actually not been um, that great. And so it's basically the large technology companies that have been driving the S and P 500. And uh, another of the charts that shows this is essentially here you can see the top um, the top ten companies in the S and P 500 by uh, by market cap basically have contributed the most to returns. Whereas if you look at the bottom half, the smaller companies, uh, they all have been um, um, not performing as well. So, so it's, it's largely these technology companies that have been leading the S&P 500. The, the next section, so just wanted to um, highlight kind of how you could look at a, a multi-asset portfolio in the US. And this is something that, uh, that we have made available on our platform via what we call as VESTs, which are our um, pre-built portfolios that kind of guide you as to how you can create a portfolio in a very new market for a lot of people. And so the way we look at it is uh, basically spreading your investments across um, stocks, bonds, and gold. And we've divided it into different risk-taking appetites. So conservative, moderate, aggressive is what you could look at. And so if you look at the, the conservative portfolios, it basically has lesser allocation to the equity investments, uh, which is the, the IT or the technology ETF, um, the S&P small cap and the high dividend yield ETFs, which are on the equity side of things. And then there is the uh, long-term treasury bonds, the US treasury bonds and the medium-term treasury bonds, which are on the um, debt side of things. And then there's gold. So these uh, different portfolios across different risk profiles is something that you could look at to create a risk optimized portfolio uh, for yourself. This is something that's available through the Vestel platform as well. And just looking at how, how returns look like across these different, uh, different kinds of portfolios. So for conservative, over the last one year, there's been about a 19% return. And this is, keep in mind that this is just US dollar returns. When you add to it the US dollar to INR returns, actually, um, over the last 10 years, we've seen there's about 3 to 4% that you can add to it on top of this uh, uh, for the currency depreciation. So conservative, moderate, aggressive, this, this is how the risk profile looks like, uh, this is how the returns look like. And then if you look at the volatility, so that's the measure of risk. Um, basically, the volatility is the least for, conser for a conservative portfolio, whereas it's the, the highest for an aggressive portfolio. So you're basically taking more risk. Um, for the the hope that you get a higher return. So according to one's risk profile, you can you can look at investing. Say for example, your um, child's education is coming up in one year. You might not want to be aggressive. You might just want to conserve your capital in US dollars, and and so you can look at a conservative portfolio. So uh, this is how how uh, a portfolio might look like in the international markets. The last section, I just want to talk a little bit about vested. Uh, and, and give you a quick demo of the platform so that you know where to find your way when, when, when you're, whenever or if you're using the platform. Uh, our company, so we're an SEC registered investment advisor. Our, our basic goal is that we want to enable sustainable wealth creation by allowing local investors to go global. Uh, the reason why we founded the company, and we are all founders that come from actually different parts of the world. We come from India, Indonesia, Hong Kong, and Singapore. And especially in India and Indonesia, um, we found that a lot of individuals there are very familiar with these brands. They're also consumers to the brands. Um, 
that are listed in the US and they contribute to the top and bottom line. But when it comes to creating wealth in an easier manner, uh, by investing into the, into these companies, they, they are left out. There's no easy way for somebody to access the markets. And, and uh, that was a personal pain point very much for me as well uh, from my JP Morgan days. And that's, that's how the company began. Um, we started it in the US and we're headquartered there, uh, growing in terms of deposits at 40% month on month and now have more than 25,000 uh, brokerage accounts that we've opened for, for investors uh, in India and NRIs as well. In terms of just some quick features, I spoke about it earlier as well. It's commission free so that you don't lose a lot of your returns just investing, um, buying and selling. And also fractional investing uh, allows you to create a portfolio in an easy manner, that is VEST. Those are the model portfolios or a different kind of portfolio um, kind of recommendations that we give that's available. Uh, there's also essentially security is one of the key things that we look at and our CTO Ying, um, she joined us from Google and, and uh, champions that effort. Uh, tax was one of the big things that was a hurdle. That's something that we've simplified as well. Uh, the remittance process, as I mentioned, we've simplified it um, more than it used to be uh, the earlier process. Uh, there's still more simplification that needs to be done, both from a cost as well as a process perspective, and uh, that's that's underway as well. Uh, yeah, in terms of uh, our our partners, so we've gotten the opportunity to work with uh, stellar partners across brokers, fintechs, wealth management companies. We recently launched our partnership with Access Securities. Um, also launched our partnership with Covera from the fintech space this week, and uh, we partnered with banks in terms of, of simplifying the remittance and, and lots more to come there as well. Uh, in terms of our investors, we've been lucky where we've gotten uh, some really good fintech investors as well as uh, investors who come from the finance space to, to invest in the company and guide us. And so the founders of Razorpay, the founders of Bharat Pay, uh, also investors from US uh, and, and Singapore that have invested in the company. Just quickly, the ecosystem that, that we've been able to create is um, vested as an investment advisor works with Drive Wealth, who is a broker partner in the US. And uh, the money or the the, the um, custody of shares is held at Citibank and Velox Clearing. So there are two custodians uh, that our broker partner works with. And each brokerage account opened up is insured up to uh, $250,000 in terms of equities and $250,000 in terms of cash. So. Uh, that is an insurance that's available through the SIPC. And um, we as Vested in turn work with different retail advisors, uh, retail investors, uh, wealth advisors, and brokers in India to provide this international service. And uh, everybody in this ecosystem is regulated by the SEC, arguably one of the strictest regulators in terms of um, uh, investments and, and, and equity markets. And now lastly, just uh, let me walk you through uh, quickly uh, how you can uh, go about the platform. Just give me one second. Uh, I will change my screen. Okay, I hope you can see it. So uh, I'm actually giving you a, a sneak peek of a a new user interface that we have created. And so this is going to be launched this week. And then so uh, you have the opportunity to, to look at it earlier. Uh, so you can basically go to app.vested.co.in to get started. And uh, uh, or you can download our mobile app or you can go through any of our partners to be able to create an account. The first step would be just to go through a KYC and uh, that's completely online. It's pretty straightforward. So I won't go through that in detail. As soon as you create an account, we prompt you to uh, go through the KYC. Here, this is an account that has that has already been funded. So I have about $10,000 in cash. This much is what I've invested. It's the current value of my portfolio. Uh, here's where you can track your portfolio returns over the last uh, one year or so. And you can basically see how your portfolio has been performing. It's been pretty good, actually. I wish I'd actually put in those $10,000 myself. Uh, so here's the, the vests that I was talking about. These are different pre-built portfolios based on different themes or on multi-assets. And uh, you can invest in any of these. So when you invest in a vest, we charge a $3 fee for you to buy into the vest. And there's an ongoing 0.5% maintenance fee um, for the vest. If you buy any other stock directly, say if you want to go in and buy Apple or Amazon, there is no commission, there's no charges. So just if you go into one of these vests, uh, this is the Moat vest. It's 
basically created around the theme that um, some companies have deep, deep um, business advantages or competitive advantages. And we've identified those companies in different industries and created a portfolio which is um, optimized for risk. And so here you could look at different kinds of companies that are on the uh, in the West. There's Alphabet, uh, there's Visa, Mastercard, there's Amazon, and the allocation. Uh, we hear talk about the reasoning as to how this portfolio was created as well. And uh, here you can see the return. So uh, it's basically performed quite well. Uh, 34% versus 15% over the uh, with the S&P 500. This is an aggressive portfolio. And what you what you get to do is basically uh, you can buy this in one click. So you say, for example, want to invest $2,000 in this. Rest. Automatically, your allocation will be calculated and uh, you can preview the order. There's a $3 fee and just it'll buy the entire basket of stocks uh, in a simple manner. So that's how you can buy into a vest. And what you see here, once you put in an order, so market opens in about an hour. Uh, once you put in an order, it'll be a pending order here. Uh, these are some other pending orders from earlier. Now that's, oops, sorry, I clicked on. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's on the vest. Here we have uh, what we have uh, called collections. Basically, you can explore based on sector, based on theme, based on geography, and, and discover different kind of investment opportunities. So say, uh, I mean, for example, I want to invest into Europe for that matter. And so here you will see companies that are, or ETFs that are investing into Europe. And um, say I want to invest into Spain. So you, you can just go in, uh, click on this. You see the performance. You can put in a buy, buy request and what you can do because of fractional, this is very interesting, is you can put in cost-based orders. So you can say, I want to buy just $50 worth of this ETF. It will automatically calculate the number of shares. And you can see you have enough money to, to be able to do this, uh, to review your order, and then place the buy order. And uh, and that's it. It's, uh, it's super simple. If the market's not open, it goes in a pending queue and gets executed once the market opens. And uh, create a watch list if you want. Uh, explore different sections. What we also do is, so it's a test account, so I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but we basically provide uh, trade confirmations. So each trade you will have some kind of confirmation. Yeah, and then you also have uh, monthly statements as well that, that you can look at uh, since the test account is not visible. And then here's a fund transfer section. So Basically, you can fund it using an, your India bank account or your um, foreign bank account where you already might have some US dollars. These are the different options of, of banks. Uh, just want to mention that you can pretty much use any bank. Uh, these are the ones that we provide pre-filled forms for. And uh, with ICICI, you can actually do this process online. Uh, a couple of other banks that will bring it online over the next two to three months or so. And uh, with HDFC in access, so we have pickup services. So if you're in Mumbai, just schedule a slot and uh, we'll ensure that the forms get picked up. You don't have to go anywhere to be able to fund your account. Uh, you can also fund it using your uh, non-Indian bank. Uh, this could be a foreign foreign uh, bank that you have an account with and, and, and easily transfer. And withdrawal is basically, if you want to bring the cash, so you can hold cash in your account. If you want to bring the, the cash back to, to uh, India, you just put in a withdrawal request. And and uh, there's currently an $11 fee. We're actually working on uh, partnering with a remittance provider to reduce this further. Earlier, it used to be $35. And still currently, with a lot of the uh, market, there is $35 withdrawals. You've reduced it already. And so you should be able to bring it back. Uh, just give us your bank details, and, and, and the money gets transferred back. So that's about the platform. And uh, that's it. Yeah, that's that's pretty much what I wanted to cover today. I spoke a lot. So uh, happy to answer any questions. I hope this was helpful. And uh, there's at least some takeaways uh, from this presentation. Thank you so much, Viram. It was definitely quite helpful. You have answered most of the questions. But I'll still, you know, uh, there are a uh, couple of questions which still need to be answered. First of all, like in Indian context, we have a concept of DMAT account where stocks are held and they are considered to be a very safe uh, option. So what is the replica? What is the kind of a DMAT thing in this context? Where is where where ultimately are securities being held? Yeah, so uh, the, way, the, the way it works in the US is a little different. 
uh, in India, we have the, the concept is basically a depository based concept. So you have um, CDSL, you have NSDL that is holding these DMAT, the DMAT accounts in your name. Now in the US, it's more of a custodian based concept and you have these custodians. So as I mentioned, Citibank and Velox clearing are the custodians. Um, these custodians hold the shares in what is called in street name. And uh, it's basically they hold the shares in the name of the broker. And that's a that's a practice that is across the US, not something specific to us. And what would happen is then on the broker's ledger is where you would see uh, individual accounts. So while they're accounts that are uh, held under your name, the sh securities are under your name, there's no depository in the middle that will send you these receipts that, or the transaction statements that we get in India. Uh, it's the broker that sends the statements and then uh, on a consolidated basis, these broker, these brokers hold shares at the custodian um, and, and, and that in our case is Citibank and, uh, Citibank and, and Velox clearing. So uh, that's, that's the structure in, in the US. And just to add to it, um, uh, basically every brokerage account is insured up to two and a half lakh dollars um, in equities and two and a half lakh dollars in cash. So uh, that is an insurance that's, that's given by the Securities Investor Protection Corporation in the US. If anything were to happen um, to the broker, it is it is a rarity that, that rarely even happens, but just for the comfort and just for the um, kind of uh, knowledge of the investor, that's something that is available for each brokerage account. So if if anyone is sitting in US and is trying to invest in the US market or, you know, uh, sitting in India, one invests in the US market using Vested as a platform, uh, is it absolutely the same thing that you have created or you're taking any shortcut? So it leading to anything, you know, that, that, in, that users should be aware of, be taken care of in terms of security measures. No, in fact, it's absolutely the same. Uh, there is no difference between us providing it to uh, investors in India or somebody providing it. We could very much provide the same service to a US-based investor as well. Uh, in fact, the fact that we are registered with the SEC, which is something that no other provider who's providing US investing is, uh, it adds another layer of, of, of protection or of comfort uh, for the end investor, basically because we uh, are subject to fiduciary duties and the SEC investment advisor uh, has to keep the, the uh, end investor in mind before making any decisions. Like, for example, we are not allowed to post any kind of testimonials of our platform such that it may influence somebody who's coming on our platform because uh, the SEC doesn't want to influence the choice of an investment advisor. So there are strict guidelines in terms of marketing that we have to keep in mind. In addition to it, we are subject to audits as well, uh, yearly audits from the SEC to ensure that our practices are all keeping in mind the end investor and all are in shape. Uh, we have a chief compliance officer as well, chief compliance protocols to basically ensure that um, give give an additional layer of protection uh, above what the broker also provides to, to our users. How does the money move? So if someone, you know, uh, creates account online, so from there on account is created, how does the money move from account to ultimately to the, it goes to the broker's account and from there it is bought. How does that happen? Yeah. So the money movement is basically from your bank account to brokerage account that's under your name back to a bank account that's under your name. So it, it basically is in accounts that are always held under your name. Uh, as vested, we don't touch the funds at any point. So say, for example, you have an account with uh, ICICI, uh, you would be putting in a request to move the money to your own brokerage account at DriveWealth. And as soon as so it goes into a pool account that DriveWealth holds, and uh, what you would do in terms of the money transfer is you would provide your DriveWealth account number. So as soon as the money uh, reaches the bank account, it's allocated to your brokerage account. And then basically you can see it as cash and start investing. At any point, if you want to withdraw it, uh, you put in a withdrawal request on the platform, uh, the Vested platform. And what we do is we instruct DriveWells to uh, return your funds to the bank account that you mentioned, which is which again has to be under your name. So while doing any realignment in the portfolio, uh, if one is selling one script and wanting to add another script, does money necessarily come back into India's account or it remains there and it can be realigned? It remains there. So that's a good thing. So once you've moved money, say once you've moved say $10,000, uh, it stays there in US dollars you can buy, sell, how much ever you want. And then only at some point, if you want to bring the money back in INR, would you, would you want to uh, put in a withdrawal request and convert it back into your account and uh, convert it back into INR and bring it back to your bank account. What you can also in the future, 
uh, something that we 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 are keenly looking at is basically allowing the spending of these dollars as well. So you might have some kind of uh, need to to pay fees or uh, the you want you might want to spend when you're traveling abroad. So those are some things that uh, that you should be able to do with any anyway dollar that you own, and uh, and that's something that would be enabled in the future. How does fund transfer actually happen? Uh, so. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the fund transfer is basically happening under the RBI's uh, liberalized remittance scheme. Now, the transfer process differs from bank to bank. And uh, say, for example, the, and there are two, two uh, ways in which you can do it. So say, for example, uh, you're using ICICI. There you can actually do this entire fund transfer online, where you can put in a request to transfer, say, $5,000 uh, through the Western platform or through ICICI. Uh, they have a platform called Money to World. And basically, uh, ICICI will convert the INR to USD and send it across to, to Drive Wealth in the US. Uh, the same thing, if you want to do it, say, with Access Bank, uh, you basically would need to submit a, a form. So earlier, one had to go to a branch, get the form, submit it, etc. Now, what you now what you'd have to do is we give you a pre-filled form, just put in your account number, name, uh, amount, and sign, and somebody from our team will come collect it and submit it to uh, one of our partner branches of Access Bank. So. Uh, that's that's how the process works. What what would someone who already holds some dollars, maybe some dollar card or an international money card, can one use that to ultimately directly you know invest? Because otherwise, you know, one will have to first convert Indian currency into U.S. currency. If one wants to avoid that and already has an access to U.S. currency, can one directly use that? Method? Yes. So, say for example, you have a USD-based bank account already, uh, and that's where if you go to the fund transfer option on Vested, you will see um, transfer from non-Indian bank, and uh, essentially that allows you to to move the USD that you already might have uh, into your brokerage account. So you can definitely definitely do that. Uh, if it's a if it's a, a forex card that is issued from India, then there are certain regulations, and and basically that is something that you cannot use. But if you have an an account which is uh, already holding cash in USD, you can definitely use that. Right, is Vested providing access to all the listed companies into on Dow Jones? Dow Jones, yes. Uh, in terms of the universe that we provide, so it's basically companies that are either listed on, on NYC or NASDAQ. And uh, what we do is we have a list of about uh, 1,100 stocks and ETFs that, uh, that we provide to our investors. And that's basically a, a curation to simplify the investment making decision. Like, for example, there are four S&P 500 ETFs in the US. Uh, we narrowed it down to one or two. That makes it easier for somebody uh, to be able to invest in, in any of those ETFs. We are also constantly adding new opportunities. So uh, as and when we see international uh, interesting companies that might be relevant to an Indian investor, we add those. What we don't want is a, a lot of people investing in, in, in penny shares, being speculative, and then losing a lot of money. Right. So there is a cross question, not clear. Why should I need to have USD money in my account? My INR will be used from my bank. So would you like to clarify this further? Yeah, yeah. so basically INR will be used. You don't need to have USD money. Only if you already have it, you can use it. A very, very basic question. You know, you have already covered it in your presentation. Uh, US market is also at its all time high. And last, like you said, you know, last five years and 10 years, US markets have actually performed more than Indian markets. For Indian investors from the perspective of diversification, you know, seeing Historical returns definitely looks that they should be participating in U.S. equities. But having seen that U.S. dollar has been strengthening, Indian currency has been kind of weakening over the last 10 years, is there a possibility of you know trend kind of reversing and eventually it impacting anybody investing into U.S. markets now? So from the perspective of valuations, though we know that Indian equity markets are relatively expensive to U.S. equity markets. What are your broad views in this context? Yeah, I mean, so the way we think about it is is basically ge geographically diversifying your portfolio um, is a is a is a concept that is something that is long term. So uh, we don't usually say that you invest your entire uh, portfolio in the U.S. Typically, people look at it as investing ten to twenty percent of their wealth uh, internationally and just getting that that uh, international exposure. So so that's just one thing as a long term trend. 
definitely that is here to stay irrespective of where the valuations are. Uh, the other thing is just, I mean, if you look at the companies and the way these um, technology companies and some of the uh, up and coming companies in the US markets are performing, uh, Basically, if you look at it in this point in time, it might be overvalued, undervalued. Uh, but over the long term, I mean, they are creating some serious value that is relevant to the globe across the world. And so over the long term, again, uh, just if you focus as a long term on the long term as an investor, then this, this opportunity definitely uh, is something that you can see makes sense. And uh, the, the third is uh, just from the point of view of the, the currency um, as long as kind of a crude way to look at it is basically inflation stays higher in India and 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 it likely will uh, since we need to grow the the rupee will likely continue to depreciate over time and so so that's that's again sort of a high level view on it um, a detailed kind of view of course we'd have to leave it to the the end investor um, I, I wouldn't be able to provide detailed advice but yeah that's that's the way uh, we're kind of looking at it and and overall somebody should just look at it as from the long term perspective and allocating a certain part of their portfolio to the international mar markets perspective so the market that you're targeting is us at the moment what is the target audience that you have is it only for indian domestic investors or nri sitting out of for example uae singapore Hong Kong, can they also be investing? Can they also invest in US using your platform? Yes. So basically, Indian residents as well as NRIs can use the platform. We have now NRIs, I think, from about 56 countries uh, that are using the platform already. And uh, they have found a lot of value as well. So so both, both uh, NRIs and resident Indians can use the platform. Any country that you're restricting in this list? Uh, there are certain uh, countries that basically uh, are, are falling under a list and, and uh, they are not allowed. And so if you just go through the vested KYC, basically those countries are not, not available for you to pick and, and you will be able to know. Have you any data to uh, kind of, you know, uh, share that your model portfolios or, you know, uh, your investors have made higher returns than maybe, you know, if they would have direct invested in, into the uh, ETFs or directly into S&P 500 index? Yeah, so in fact, if you go onto the Western platform, uh, you should be able to see all of the data. And um, basic the basic goal for these portfolios is one, uh, going after a certain theme. So going after, say, software as a service as a theme or going after, um, say, moat as a theme. And so if you believe in, in those themes and if you believe that, that, that they will in the long term uh, outperform the market, then that is something that you can look at. Or the other goal is uh, giving you a sort of a market return, but at a better risk rate. And, and so that's what these multi-asset portfolios are, are uh, aimed at doing, where they have equity, they have bonds, they have gold. Uh, so you don't end up taking a lot of risk, but also you can get, uh, I mean, if you look at the last uh, last 10, 10, 10 years or so for those multi-assets, you've gotten about um, 8 to 12 percent in terms of returns. And, and that's generally what the equity markets in the U.S. over the long run have returned as well. How difficult well, an annual basis? Yeah, sorry. How difficult is it to you know obtain the SEC registration or license you know to start with? Because in Indian context, we know there are a lot of norms. If one has to, one, one wants to become an advisor, there are advisory norms. You know, for portfolio management, there are portfolio management norms. There are certain stipulated guidelines in terms of you know requirement of capital. So, what what are your minimum guidelines and requirements that you have fulfilled? to be able to create and run this platform? I mean, it's it's the same, if, if not um, more stringent in terms of just ongoing policies and procedures that we need. So uh, we basically need to have a, a compliance officer in place, ensure that our policies in terms of um, anti-money laundering, in terms of KYC, uh, in terms of tracking all our, our uh, internal uh, shareholding, all of those need to be in place. So, so there is uh, kind of a lot of things that need to be done to be able to get that license. Uh, what we have, so we are basically an, an online only advisor. So essentially uh, what we do is we provide advice through our platform only and, and not in person. And so any advice that you get from Vested will be through the platform itself. Uh, none of our team members will be able to give any kind of personalized advice. So does that require you to 
have uh, you know sebi's advisory license or any other uh, licenses in indian context we will get our sebi license as well uh, basically i have given all the nism uh, exams that were needed and i already applied for it so it will be an additional um, additional layer on top of it uh, both both kind of cover the same kind of um, norms and 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 protection for the end investor so i think you know uh, everybody is really uh, liking your uh, uh entire uh, creation and uh, to my understanding most of the questions have been answered but i will just you know want you to explain once again uh, the the formal uh, procedure of how the flow of money happens because that is where i am getting most of the questions you know i think investors are not clear in that regards because still investors still you know uh, the audience of investors uh, or aspirants who are logged on to this session they are trying to ask questions with regards to the hassles which are there in transferring the money yeah so um, the hassles is so so basically the the way the 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 money transfer process works um, it's not as seamless as doing an nft or rtgs like you might to your uh, india broker the way you would do it uh, given it's a cross border transaction is through the uh, under the rbi's liberalized remittance scheme through your bank and in terms of the process uh, also it's not uh, essentially it's not hassle free because it's not completely online yet uh, however say if you work with if you bank with icici you can still do it online in an easy manner so what happens is basically your inr needs to be converted to uh, us dollars to load it into your brokerage account and to do that you could go through any of the banks uh, that you work with or you have an account with and uh, there are two processes currently one is an online process one is an offline process um, say if you're going for icici which is online you basically can put in a request to move the money to drivewell and um, and it it will be done typically it takes about one business day or two business days and uh, you don't need to do any kind of form filling or anything of that sort the second uh, way to transfer the funds is uh, through the offline mode which is majority of the banks currently and where we've um, kind of tried to simplify the process is uh, offering a, a kind of a pre-filled form uh, as well as the ability to to get the form picked up and submitted to the branch and and in fact get better rates as well and uh, there you would get a form in your email you you would you have to print it sign it put in the put in the amount that you want to transfer uh, with access bank we have a a flat kind of 1% fx markup uh, versus what they typically charge is about 2 to 3% and uh, we submit it to the bank branch it again takes the same amount of time and and the dollars get credited into your uh, brokerage account i hope i hope that helps right so if you know uh, someone transfers to begin with an amount of say uh, you know uh, $20000 to do an investment and uh, you know one is unable to decide ultimately in which scripts one is wanted to invest and that $20000 is invested say over a period of one month so during that one month does one receive any interest on that $20000 or you know money which is not ultimately invested and it remains idle does it get parked parked into any kind of a short term deposit or a short term debt fund so yeah so that money is basically held in a in a bank sweep so it's held in a bank which uh, does give interest However, given the interest rate environments in the U.S., so earlier it used to be about 1.6 percent annually that you would get um, in USD. Right now, of course, it's the interest rates have almost gone to zero, and so the interest is is minimal. Uh, what one could look at is, say, parking the money in a in a U.S. Treasury uh, ETF or a or a, um, a short term uh, debt fund or a debt ETF, essentially, if they want to earn earn interest on the the money that they haven't invested yet. so uh, can you please explain uh, you know uh, once again how many entities are involved so you know uh, one opens one uh, logs into vested online and then from there onwards you know it goes to the brokerage account and then custodian bank so what are the what are the layers of various entities involved yeah i think these are the three three main layers from a, a end user perspective you would just be interacting with vested finance because we help simplify the entire back end uh but just for the information of the end user 
they can know that hey, this is the custodian where my money is held. This is a broker who I have an account with, uh, and and they would be interacting with Vested through our online platform. Right. Do you have any plans to uh, make other economies also operational apart from U.S. markets? Yeah, over over time. Uh, currently, what we want to do is firstly allow people to invest in the U.S. markets in an easy manner. Once that is something that we feel enough people know about and are educated about, then we can look at different markets as well. Having said that, uh, as I showed during the demo as well, through the U.S. markets, you basically can invest into the entire globe essentially. So it's a proxy for the global markets where you have ETFs that are investing into almost every country in the world. Uh, you also have companies that that have uh, uh, stocks listed in the U.S. or ADRs listed in the U.S. Uh, for example, Toyota is listed there or um, Alibaba is listed there. So you can invest in those companies as well. Uh, so so it's a good way for somebody to get, get exposure to the world. So if, you know, uh, one kind of tries to create an account just now on Vested's platform, it says that it will take four or five days to, uh, you know, process. What does that mean? So um, the current flow, and again, all of these things are, are improving uh, as we get more and more efficient. Uh, what the current flow is basically, we do a check, a KYC check on our end, and then the broker does a KYC check from their end. And um, due to COVID, things have been a little slow. It typically does not take that long. It, ta it takes one to two business days, essentially. Uh, in case there is a, a, a discrepancy in the documents or uh, they are not as per the SEC's requirements. We revert back to the customer, asking them to uh, submit documents that would work. And so that might take some uh, longer time in processing. But if it, everything is in order, it, it might even just take one day. So if you submit your uh, request today or tomorrow, it might get opened by night once the US opens. Thank you so much, Viram. So I think most of the questions have been answered. And I really liked uh, you know the entire concept. And I think it adds a lot of value. I can tell you uh, there are a lot of investors who have been wanting to invest overseas, especially in US markets. And this provides a very open platform to them to ultimately invest basis their own uh, you know, decision making. Uh, uh, you know, while I'm uh, trying to give the concluding notes, there are, uh, there, there are a few offhand questions which are being asked by uh, I think some of the advisors and distributors who are also logged in uh, on this webinar. And that pertains to what is your revenue model? How do you make money? It's an optional, you know, you may want to answer. You can answer this. Yeah, I mean, uh, no full transparency. So for us, we basically had a decision whether we want to charge commission or uh, try and, and, and uh, figure out a different business model. What we realized was just thinking from an user perspective, um, commission ended up becoming very expensive. Say you want to buy into, for example, you wanted to buy into a vest, which has 10 companies in it. Uh, it just makes it about I mean, earlier it used to be about three dollars or so. Thirty dollars in, in in terms of commission is just two thousand rupees gone uh, in the, on top of any kind of FX fees etc that you have to pay. So pay. So it, it, it just ended be, ended up becoming very expensive. So what we what we decided was um, we'll have a different model wherein uh, we have certain kind of value add features that we provide. So for example these vests where we are providing uh, advisory. We keep adding more and more value add features, which will be chargeable and, and provide value to the end user so that it's worth it for them to pay as well. Uh, what we have with, say, for example, with our uh, uh, access securities partner or um, soon on the B2C is also a subscription plan, which gives you additional features uh, that allow you to create a portfolio in a better manner. And so we, we charge for that. Uh, with our partners, some of these partners, they, they charge uh, as a percentage of AUM because they're giving uh, advisory on the entire US dollar assets. And so uh, we do a revenue share with B2B partners. Um, and also what we're looking to do is work with banks uh, to be able to get some kind of revenue share from them uh, since we are providing to them additional business. Right. Really like your transparency. So we also really value that. We also absolutely ask, you know, uh, as much transparency one can kind of express, it adds a lot of confidence to investors. And thank you uh, for this detailed session. We are bang on time. You know, it's exactly one hour. And if there are any more questions that we see in the chat box, I will request you to kind of answer that. We'll send you an email and then we can share a detailed note, or maybe, you know, post this webinar. Is that fine? Yeah, for sure. 
Right. Thank you, everyone, for logging on to this uh, webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Have a good weekend.